Today we're going to be talking about high-level synthesis, and particularly high-level synthesis with Forte's synthesizer product. We'll take a brief look at what high-level synthesis is and isn't, look at it in the context of a trivial example, and talk a little bit about exploration and optimization of designs using high-level synthesis, and then talk about some of the next steps that you could take to learn more about this exciting new development in electronic design. So what is high-level synthesis? Basically, it's a transformation of a behavioral C++ model to Verilog RTL. In addition to this behavioral model as an input, the tools also take things like constraints and directives. By constraints, it would be something like a latency constraint, i.e. I need a particular function to be implemented in four clock cycles. Uh, directives might include things like loop unrolling or the fact that you need the design to be pipelined, etc., etc. The technology library is also an input. This is required so that the tool can understand the constraints it has on the final implementation. And this is very, very important in terms of how fast certain operations, for example, a multiplier and adder may be, and how large they may be in the context of the final design. The output in Verilog RTL will include a state machine and a data path. And that data path will be comprised of various different functional units, what we call building blocks for high-level synthesis. And these include things like, as I mentioned, multipliers, adders, dividers, floating point units, etc., etc. So as I mentioned, the basic idea here is that high-level synthesis will create a hardware description in RTL from an untimed algorithm in C++. The big difference here is not just the translation or the transformation from C++ to Verilog. It's the fact that there are clock cycles inserted into the design to make it fit more correctly into the downstream flow. It will build a state machine. It will take care of all of the memories for you. It will take care of all the registers for you. And it will automatically break the entire design up into the discrete clock cycles that are required by the logic synthesis tools downstream. All of this is taken care of by the high-level synthesis tool. However, it doesn't mean that you can completely ignore the fact that you're designing hardware. This is not a software process. You need to understand the targets that you're building for. You need to understand that there are good coding styles in high-level synthesis just as there are in RTL. You can be a good designer and a bad designer, and that still applies in high-level synthesis. You have to understand that process, and you have to remember you're still a designer, and you're still designing hardware. What high-level synthesis is not is it's not the same as writing software. People often ask, well, what is the difference between writing software and writing hardware? And this is often best demonstrated through the use of an example. So let's imagine that you're building a filter for an image that is in JPEG format. In software, you may write an algorithm that reads a file into an array. The array is two-dimensional, and all of the data is always present throughout the execution of the filter algorithm. In hardware, we know this is very, very rarely the case. Data has a transient nature. It comes, it's processed, and it leaves. And very, very rarely do we have the entire data set in registers or in any kind of storage at any one time. So this transient nature of data is very, very important to the way the algorithm is expressed so that it can be processed by the high-level synthesis tool and so that you can get a result that would closely match your hand-coded RTL or be even better. And so that's a very, very important distinction between the approach that you take and how you handle that kind of data. This is one of the big differences between software and hardware design. And it's not the same as writing RTL. The input code is far more abstract, and this gives a lot of benefits in terms of productivity and retargetability, particularly from the fact that you don't have to put in clock cycles. You can target this to different clock cycles over different technology nodes over many, many different years, dramatically improving the life of your IP. This graphic shows a basic high-level synthesis flow. The behavioral model is input. It is read. The algorithm is processed and a number of algorithmic optimizations are implemented on the design. These tend to be pretty language focused and are very similar to a lot of compiler type optimizations you would imagine in a regular C compiler. We then build a control and data flow graph, analyze that and perform optimizations, deal with the libraries that we have. This includes things like extracting timing information for various functional units, etc. One of the main tasks of a high level synthesis tool is embodied in the scheduler. This is the algorithm inside the tool that will take a look at the control and data flow graph and split it up into clock cycles. This is a very important and high value step 
and it takes into account a lot of the timing and latency constraints that you put into the tool at the beginning of the run. The last major step is binding. In binding, we basically tie all of the operations that are in the control and data flow graph to actual functional units that are going to appear in the Verilog RTL. In that process, we implement a very, very important step in high-level synthesis called sharing. What that means is that we determine exactly what functional units can be shared with other functional units and exactly the same thing for registers so that we can minimize the number of resources that are present in the final design. Let's just take a look at a concrete example. It always makes things easier. In this case, we have a very, very simple function in C++ that we want to synthesize to a particular technology at 200 megahertz, i.e. a 5 nanosecond clock. And this design is completely untimed. It doesn't specify a latency. It doesn't specify which values are registered and how they'll be stored. All it says is, here's the arithmetic I want to have performed. Synthesizer will map all of those C++ operations, the star and the plus, to various different functional units or library cells and add the relevant clock boundaries in order to minimize the area of this design. The first thing it'll do is build this control and data flow graph and it could look like something that you see here on the screen. Here you can see that we have the various inputs coming into the two multipliers and the Y adder and then the final adder producing the Y output. Now in this particular representation there is no notion of time, there is no notion of clocks. In order to perform the next step, the high level synthesis tool needs to understand some of the characteristics of timing. The way they do that is that the HLS tools look at the timing and area of the relevant functional units that are going to be used to implement the design. And high-level synthesis tools typically do this in one of two ways. Either through the use of a pre-characterized library, or it creates the functional units on the fly and extracts the timing and area data. With a pre-characterized library flow, it basically means there is a process that is run before the high-level synthesis run that generates a lot of these functional units and extracts the timing and area information at that time. Let's assume we have a characterized library flow and the three operations that we're interested in are actually an 8x8 multiplier, a 20x20 multiplier, and a 16 plus 16 bit adder. And the relevant delays and areas for this particular technology node are shown in the table. An initial schedule of this might look like, depending on the tree that we had before, two 8x8 multipliers, a 16 plus 16 bit adder, and a 20 by 20 multiplier. If we go and look at how that would be scheduled cycle by cycle and the total area that would be produced if we instantiated all of those functional units, we would see we would need three cycles, two multipliers in the first cycle, an addition in the second cycle, and the final multiply in the third cycle, giving us a total for all four of those functional units of about 39k square microns. Timing here is clearly met. But the scheduler would note that it doesn't need to do the second 8 by 8 multiply in the same cycle as the first one. It can do it in parallel to the adder instead of in, in parallel to the original multiply. So it could move that second multiplication into cycle 2 and this would mean that it would only require one 8 by 8 multiplication operation. This would reduce the area down to 34k, and since they're in parallel and they don't have common inputs, then we have no issue with timing there either. Now we could go on to binding, and this is where each of the operations in the control data flow graph get mapped to actual functional units that will appear in the Verilog RTL. At this point, we actually look at sharing, and the binding algorithm will note that there are three multiply operations in three different cycles. They don't have overlapping lifetimes. And so it will attempt to share those three onto a single multiplier in the Verilog output. What that means is that the two 8x8s actually get mapped to the 20x20, 20 20, and that's a valid share. It will map the two 8x8s onto the 20x20 20 20 multiplier, get exactly the same functionality, and a significant reduction in area. So the total area now is down to 29k from the original 39. As you can see here, the step-by-step -step refinement of the schedule and the binding dramatically improved the area of this design. The final step is output generation, generating the Verilog output. A graphical view of that output would look as shown in this diagram. There is an FSM, finite state machine. There is a set of registers, and MUX is controlling the values on those registers. There are two functional units, the 16 plus 16 bit adder and the 20 by 20 multiplier. 
and that multiplier is used to do all three of the multiplications in the design, as you can see by the muxing on the inputs. Now clearly there are select lines on these muxes that go to the FSM and they're not explicitly shown, but, but they're obviously present. Now what we've seen so far has been a very, very simple example and clearly Synthesizer can handle far more complex examples and designs than we've seen today. In order to do that, we've had to add a lot of optimization techniques and some of these include things like array flattening, into register files, loop unrolling, loop pipelining, data path optimization through special techniques and flags and controls, etc. We also have a lot of communication IP that is included in the synthesizer package. That includes point-to-point -point channels, memories of various types, interfaces to memories, characterized memories, and a number of other kinds of interfaces for communication between blocks, things like line buffers and ping pong buffers and FIFOs, etc., as well as interfaces to standard buses. Synthesizer also includes the Synthesizer Workbench, which is a configuration management tool. It also implements a lot of integrations with other EDA tools to improve your downstream flow. What we've seen today is a very brief introduction to high-level synthesis through the implementation of a very, very trivial design. If you'd like to have more information, don't hesitate to contact Forte for more details. If you already have a synthesizer knowledge base login, I encourage you to go there and look at the various different sections. There are a lot of tips and tricks, a lot of more complex examples, and I very much encourage you to explore and learn more about HLS through this venue.